Well, thank you for coming. Uh, I said, I'm Marius Mikhailidis. Today I would like to explain to you um, mostly, mostly about stacking and how we are going to integrate that uh, through driverless AI in order to make, to make the most out of stacking. And if we have time, I'll see, uh, I might talk a bit about StackNet, which is an open source tool that helps you do uh, stacking on multiple levels. So let me start a bit with my, my background, although Wen did a very good job, but I guess I could add a few bits. I work as a research data scientist for H2O. Uh, my PhD is in fact in ensemble methods, ensembles as in how we combine many models in order to get uh, better predictions. And I used to be uh, Kaggle number one at some point last year. Uh, I'm actually still number two. Uh, and I have to admit that stacking has helped me, or perfecting, if I can use this term, or improving this technique has helped me greatly to, to get an edge uh, over other competitors. I would like to start with a very naive, a simple example about how multi-meta modeling works. When I say meta modeling is how we use models as input to other models to make predictions, and multi here means how we can do that multiple times. I would like to start with a very, very simple and naive example, just you know, so that you can understand conceptually you know, how it works, like simply, put it simply. So let's say we have three kids. They argue about the physics questions. Let's call them students in this scenario. We have LR, SVM, KNN. They all give different answers to this physics question. One gives 13, other 18, other 11. And they make different arguments. They try to come up with an answer, and they take an average. Of course, it is the democratic thing to do. And they say the answer is 14. You can imagine of these students as, as models, because they have a way of taking some input data. Here is some question about physics, right? They process it through their brains. They have some, some mechanisms, some, some, some skills. And they output some, some predictions, right? And um, how, and, and, and a simple way to combine it is an average. But can we get a better, a better answer if we introduced a higher authority? And let's say, just for this example, that we have a teacher. So Miss DL overheard the argument. She didn't manage to hear the physics question. And let's say she doesn't even know physics herself. She's a math teacher. And although she doesn't know the question, she does know the students. So she knows the strengths and weaknesses. She knows where they do well and where they don't. And for example, for SVM, she knows that she's really good in physics. Her father works in the uh, Physics Institute of Excellence or something. And she's much more keen to put higher weight to her prediction than, than in other students. And she says the answer is 17. And in this scenario, this is a meta model. This is what we say a meta model, because we take other models' predictions, we use knowledge of how these models have done historically, or what we know about their strengths and weaknesses, and we try to get to a better outcome. And we can make this a bit more complicated. We can say that actually Mr. Aref also overheard that discussion, and he has a slightly different opinion. He has been secretly doing private lessons to LR, and he believes that he couldn't be that far off. So he's more keen to lower the weight, to put the right answer somewhere to 16 without having heard the question. And they can either take, you know, like an average, or we can introduce again a higher authority that doesn't know the children, doesn't know the question, but does know the, the teachers. And let's say in this scenario, Headmaster GBM is more keen to trust his Mr. RF, who is a physics teacher, and lean the answer towards, towards his prediction. So that's, that's a simple example about how meta modeling conceptually can work in practice, what, what we try to do when we try to combine many machine learning models together to get a better prediction by introducing this, this 
hierarchy. So one way to do this is by using a technique called stacking or stack generalization. This was introduced in 1992 by uh, a person, by, by Walbert. Uh, it, it's, it's quite simple. So you have two data sets, let's say a training and the validation data set. You train several models with one data set and you make predictions to the other data set. Then you take these predictions with the other data set and you sort of treat it as a new data set. So these predictions are treated as a new data set. And you can fit a new model to make further predictions. And because this still may be confusing, consider, consider this. So we have three data sets that look fairly similar. Let me see if I can get that laser to work. Oh, there you go. So we have data set A that has features, uh, four features and the target variable, which is binary. We have a similar data set B with the same structure, but we don't know the answer for data set C. So what can we do is we can train an algorithm with data set A to predict Y, and we can make predictions for B and C at the same time. The predictions come as probabilities, the probabilities to be one. And we save these probabilities in two new data sets. And now we're going to repeat this. Let's pick another algorithm, a new one. And let's do the same. Train a data set, uh, train an algorithm on data set A and make predictions to B and C at the same time. Stack these predictions to the respective new data sets B1 and C1. Uh, and you can see where the word stacking comes from because slowly we start formulating new, new data sets. And let's do it one more time. Pick a third algorithm make predictions. So what happens now, we have created two new uh, data sets with, with predictions that came from algorithms fit in, in data set A. And for B, we actually know the answer is here. So let's try to use another algorithm to associate these predictions with this target and apply it here. And there you go, you can get the probabilities of this being one or zero. So this is how stacking works in practice. It may sound simple, but it has been really, really successful to, to combine many algorithms together. However, there is a small issue with this approach and I will try to show it to you. As, as I showed you, in order for this to work, you need to always have some holdout data some data where you make predictions and these are unbiased. So if you have some training data and you wanted to use stacking, you have to use half for training and half to make the predictions. If assuming that multi-layer stacking, so adding a, a headmaster can improve your predictions, that means you will have to do it again. So you have to constantly keep resplitting your data because stacking always requires holdout predictions uh, in order to, to, um, to be able to continue doing stacking on multiple levels. You, you can see the problem with this approach. If you have too much data, then there is no much problem. But if you don't have that much, you will end up with really, really small holdout data sets here. And sometimes we even go three and four levels doing this in order to, to get the most out of, of the, this multi-layer stacking. So I think you have already far on explained that, but we use a different way in order to, to do this. So consider a data set. We're going to use a K-fold validation strategy in order to create holdout predictions for the whole training data. Normally this, this K is a hyperparameter when we say K-fold. It means that we are going to to split our data set into four parts in this scenario. This is a hyperparameter. We would have picked something else. We would have picked five or, or 10. Here, I pick four. Also, it doesn't need to be sequential as, as I've shown you here. Could be shuffled, but just, just for, for illustration purposes, I did like that. So what we're going to do now is we are going to generate an empty vector, and we want to populate this with an algorithm's predictions for the whole training data. But we have to respect this holdout fashion. We have to respect the fact that we need to make predictions in holdout data. 
So what we're going to do is, in the first fold, we're going to use a subset of this data to train a model, and we are going to use that model to make predictions for the blue part. We are going to take the predictions for the blue part and, and save them in, in the array that is meant to hold the holdout predictions for the whole training data. And now we're going to repeat this process. So in the second fold, we are going to use the red part to make predictions and blue, yellow, and green to fit the model. And do the same thing, save the predictions in, in, in that vector. And we will use this rotation until we manage to score the whole training data and populate it fully so that we don't miss anything. Now we have, we have some training predictions uh, generated in a whole file fashion. So we haven't, we haven't compromised, we haven't introduced leakage to, and, and in connection with what Fyron said before uh, to, this, to this prediction. And this is how we generate training predictions. In order to generate test predictions, we can retrain on the whole data now and make predictions to, for, the, for the test data. And this is how we have now to, uh, we have finished with one algorithm. If we wanted to add another one, we repeat the same process. So we add a new vector next to it. We are going to use the same rotation. We are going to use a subset of the data to fit a model and make predictions on the other one until we fully complete the, fully, until we fully populate the vector. We do this until we have as many models as we want. And then we have constructed, constructed a new data set. And we can repeat this process then. We can repeat it as many times as, as we want. We can use the new data set to repeat. Instead of having x0, x1, you know, x3, now we're going to have pred1, pred2, pred3. And we will repeat the same process. So from, from, from experience, there is also obviously literature that, that supports this. In order to get the most out of stacking, you do it by generating diversity. So you need to make certain that your models are, are different or they make different mistakes. In other words, they have different strengths and weaknesses, exactly as, as I saw it before. And a good way to generate diversity is just by selecting different algorithms. So the strategy which I have used in the past and it has been quite successful is to use two or three different gradient boosted trees. For example, let's say light GBM or XG boost, but I make certain I, they're slightly different. So I make one, let's say, which is fairly shallow, so small maximum depth, one that has, let's say, medium size and one that has very big size because I know they will, they will grow differently. They will focus on different, on different areas. And I do the same with other algorithms. So I will build two or different neural networks or deep learning models, any way you want to put it, where I will have different structure. So I will have, let's say, one hidden layer in the first one, two hidden layers in the second, three hidden layers in the last one. Again, what I'm aiming is to to make models which are slightly different, so I'm able to, with the, with the, with the, with the teacher algorithm, to, to find in which area each of the algorithms is good in order to, to capitalize on it. I use some different versions of Radom Forest. I like a few linear models. Surprisingly enough, k as neighbor models normally add very well in stacking, and this is, this is something that Sometimes people don't see that when you compare one k nearest neighbor model with a gradient boosting model, the performance seems huge. So you would almost say this k and n model is, 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 is crap. However, when it goes to meta modeling, it has produced enough diversity in order to add value. Its predictions is, is, is very different. And on many occasions, I found that you know, it adds value. So just, that, that's why just looking at tuning one algorithm, sometimes it's not enough. You know, you, you might um, focus on the tree, but yeah, miss the forest. I like a few factorization machines. Uh, so a second way to introduce diversity and get the most out of your ensemble is by your input data. 
So you have already seen different transformations that you can do, uh, you know, to for it, it, you know for different type of features. Like, for example, for categoricals, you can do dummy coding, label encoding, target encoding. You've seen. Uh, I don't want to go to too much details about this. I, I just list a few different possible views you can have of your data. The main idea is that you make each data set slightly different so that a model can focus in different areas. And this is where we get to Otto Casanova 42, which is the means by which we try to get the most out of, of, of stacking. So how we can generate all this diversity in order to make certain we, we get, we exhaust any sort of information from inside the data. And consider the following. We have a set of available algorithms. This is just a few I'm listing here. This won't be all, but just a few algorithms which are, which are different in nature and a few different transformations. Some apply to categorical data and some apply to numerical data. And then what we do is <clears throat> we create semi-random views of this. For example, let's take a gradient boosting machine and let's use one hot encoding to transform categorical data and let's do some binning on the numerical data. Now let's pick something else, a deep learning model where the only transformation I do is scale the, the numerical features. Or a factorization machine model which I apply more transformations. And then to each one of these views, I'm also adding a, a few more layers. So I try to tune the hyperparameters, I try to create features or remove features, uh, and I also try to, to select the best features, or I will do less than that. The point is, this process doesn't need to be perfect. You don't need to make the best models here. What you are interested in is to make models that are different, because if you build hundreds of different models by generating constantly different views, you are very likely to exhaust at some point all the information that is available within the data. At least this is what I have found, this is what has helped me a lot to, to get uh, number one in Kaggle. Uh, so what I do then, you know, after generating these hundreds of models which are different semi-random views of, of, of feature engineering, feature selection, and data transformations, I start removing what is no longer needed. So I start, I start trimming down to what was actually important. It's extremely difficult to know in advance what was important. It's almost, that there are many things that could work, but what I have found is that you cannot know in advance. You know, it's, 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 there, there, there are many ways to get to the best outcomes. So using this, sort of genetic algorithm type of way of generating model and, and, and feature combinations can help you get close to the best possible answer. This is, this is what I have found and this is what we are working on added, adding to, to, to driverless. And since we have time, I would like to show you a, an open source tool I've built. It's also a methodology that allows you to do this multi-layer uh, stacking. Uh, it has many available algorithms and it works pretty scalably. So um, that means that you know, all these student models can run in parallel. So you can build many, many models if, assuming you have many cores available. And um, uh, yeah, what's really good is that you can uh, try all sorts of transformations and see what's really working and what's not working. So it, it can be sort of your playground. Let's see if this architecture you know, would work. It has some, com some command line parameters. I don't want to go to too much details about how to use this. I obviously point to, to, to the right resources at the end for you to play with if you want to see the tutorial. I'm mostly... I mostly want to show you an example later on about how different architecture of meta modeling can help you to get better results. I guess the, the interesting thing about the, the command line parameters for, in order to use this tool is that you, it's this parameters file. 
So in the parameters file, you can, it's just a simple txt file where you specify the, 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 student the student algorithms. Here is, for example, a logistic regression, a gradient boosting forest classifier, random forest classifier. And then you specify the, the teacher. And you, know, and you can keep adding that. You can keep adding layers. So every time you break a line, is, is, a, new, is a new meta layer. So you can try all sorts of architectures here. This was done as part of my PhD. It works pretty simply. A few, a few commands, classification or regression. Uh, you provide a train file with a CSV, a test file, again a CSV. This parameters file, which just lists the meta modeling architecture. Uh, how many threads you want to use. And normally, the, the, the input file looks like that, like quite tabular, target column in the beginning, and, and then the features. And then I have an example, which is also in GitHub. And uh, I invite you to try it afterwards if you want. It's, it's pretty simple. So we have a target column and, and some features, right? Some comma-separated comma features. Uh, train and test files are, are very similar. And these are all the, the commands we're going to try. But let's do it step by step. I want to show you building an, a, an ensemble, a multi-layer ensemble gradually, uh, how, what are the benefits. So let's take the most simple architecture for this problem. We start with a linear regression as, as a student and the linear regressor as a teacher. What you should point out uh, what you should see up is the, the parameters of, of the models. So here, are, these are the parameters that control the complexity of the model. This particular one is regularization. What you should note here is that I have put very bad values. These are very bad hyperparameters for this problem. I put it on purpose because I also want to show you the importance of tuning. However, uh, generally, what you should know is the best C here is something like 0 0.000001. So I just tried to put a slightly better C in the meta model. So let's see what happens. You run this command, and you get this kind of root mean square error. Here, the smaller it is, the better it is. So as you can see, the first model, let's say, did not so well. But the meta model has actually managed to correct a lot of the errors of this model. It has dropped down the error significantly. And, and this is just one model. That's just because I have put better parameters on this one. And this one has really, really bad parameters. And what this would look like, actually, it's not so bad. Because if you try to plot the prediction with the actual value, you get an R square of 0 0.91. And, and you can see that you know, the, the, it, it looks pretty nicely. I mean, it's not a perfect line, but there, there is definitely a margin of error. But it, it, it's, it's, it's not too bad. Uh, I made it on purpose. It is an artificial data set so that it is fairly easy to, to, to get a good score. So what if we try to rerun this, but this time we put slightly better parameters? So same models, I just put a very a sensible regularization value. Same problem. So as you can see now, the error has dropped a lot. But uh, the, I guess the gain from the meta-modeling is, is not so big anymore. So you, the, the, the scores were pretty much the same. However, you can see that the overall prediction right now is, is much, much better. You can see it's almost the prediction almost falls on top of the, the actual value. What if we try to introduce one more student here? Let's try to introduce a gradient boosting machine. What happens to the same problem? So you can see the gradient boosting machines just, it does slightly better than the linear regression. But when put together, the teacher model is able to improve the score quite, quite a lot. And you can see what this looks in terms of graph. You can see now the line has moved, has become more straight. And we can improve even further if we add a neural network student. So here, I'm not surprised that the neural network has done multi-layer perception, perceptron, has done that much better because I generated the data artificially through a neural network. But you can see that the meta-learner, the, the teacher, is able to squeeze the error even more down. 
you can see now it becomes even more like a straight line. So what if we pick a different teacher now? Let's try to pick a random forest, which uh, historically has been a better, a better meta learner. So with the same input data, the same input students, is able to get the score even more, even more down. You can see it's even more as a straight line, but we lose a few cases, a few, a few cases on, on the top. Let's try to put everything back in, so also add the linear regression as a teacher, and also introduce a headmaster, which is also a linear regressor. And you can see we are further able to get the error even more down. And what this looks in terms of graph is, is, is like that. So the error now is even smaller. We, 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 we go towards almost a straight line between the, the, the prediction and, uh, and the actual value. And here you just saw how this multi-layer architecture of models was able to squeeze the error and give you a few more decimal points uh, you know, out, you know, reduce the error and give you a, a better prediction. And this has been pretty much uh, the Kaggle story for me. This is how I was able to, uh, obviously not with just two models. Sometimes I had, we had like 600 and 700 models, but this has been uh, a small simulation of the things uh, I've tried to, to, to get competitive scores. So I list a few more resources here. So uh, how you can learn more about driverless. Uh, I have a video about how you get competitive with driverless where I show you how you can do more stacking out of driverless output. And how you can, there is also code that comes with that. How you can get stacknet and how you can replicate this example you just saw and maybe try your own architecture. And before we go to questions, thank you very much for coming and uh, choosing me for your entertainment. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, happy to take any, any questions. Let's get the Slido uh, screen up. I think we've got a few questions in the queue waiting for you. First one from, from my good friend uh, Raymond Pack. What's the uh, Disadvantage of including the original features in the data feed to the meta learners. Seems like it helped them to combine the models in a smarter way. I like this. I, I, I do it. I tell you when this doesn't help me. So this doesn't help me when I have produced many, 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 many models. Because I have pretty much exhausted all the information that it was there in the initial data. But when I made not that many, like five or ten, actually putting those predictions back to the original data tends to give me a, a, bit, a bit more. But I think that's, that's the main logic. So if you have really exhausted the information within the data, so run many, many different models, normally you don't need to restack. This is how we call it. You don't need to put back the original features. But when you haven't done that many, then you should consider adding the original features in. Okay, uh, so this is a real-time board, depending on likes. So I guess the, the, the likes here is, do stacking models beat deep learning models in terms of accuracy? Uh, it, it depends. I mean, uh, mm, well, stacking of deep learning models will beat just deep learning models. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I, 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 I don't see it as a competition. Uh, what you should know is that in principle, yeah, single models lose from, from stacking. The idea is how you can get more out of your, uh, out of your models. Generally, stacking beats single models, though. Now, if you have managed to build this a super strong, you know, like deep learning model, uh, I guess you can beat even a stacking approach. But I would say in principle, Nothing stops a really strong deep neural network model to be added with other weaker models and improve that score even further through stacking. Uh, after building so many models, how do you decide which model is to trim out? I do standard, actually, feature selection, any way you would do, because then your models be become columns, right? Become variables. So I use standard feature selections technique. Anything goes here. 
You can do forward selection or backward selections. Or we, we like to use something which is called um, selection with, with, with permutation, which is we, we build the model we, and, uh, with all the features in. Then at scoring time, we take one column out and we randomly shuffle it. We shuffle it and we put it back in. So you have one feature which is wrongly inputted into your data and you make the prediction. And you see how off your prediction is. If your prediction is very off, that means this feature was very, very important. So we create a ranking like that for all possible features and we tend to keep the, the ones we, that the, they had the most detrimental effect on, 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 the, on the overall error. And that's, that's a good way to, to do feature slash model selection. But yeah, any, any standard feature selection works here because basically the, the models are variables in a data set. Yeah. So I think this is a, a pragmatic question or definitely an organizational one. Uh, with so many models, what's your naming convention for each model? How do you keep track of uh, which models you've tried and their performances. Actually, that's good. I have an automated way of, 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 saving, of, of saving this. So uh, every time I, I train a model, you're right. The, the initials of each model is saved along with the parameters in a CSV file. So this, this is a good way to, to keep track of this. I have this automated. Yeah, random forest, RF. Uh, gradient boosting machines, JBM. Um, and if I use it through different, uh, yeah, if I use LightGBM, I name it LightGBM. So I think I'm not doing something crazy here. I mean, it's, but yeah, I, it, it's good to, to have a way to monitor this because it can get really messy. I always create a log file with all the models I've tried. Uh, I'm not sure what this next question is asking, but I'll ask it. After the first stack, only left with one input. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I don't get. <clears throat> what type of stacking model do you find most effective? Regression, neural networks, XGBoost? Depends on the problem. Uh, I think neural networks actually have worked better for me as, as meta learners most of the times. Uh, but de depends. Uh, not regression though. Re most of the times not regression. So neural network or XGBoost. Or a, a extremely randomized trees, also, also useful. OK, uh, let's see. Do you think adding predictions of models as new features of the data set would increase the performance of the final model? I think that's what that I think we doing. have already answered that. Yeah. yeah, I think it's pretty much the same. It depends. As again, the answer is the same if you build many uh, many models and many diverse models. Normally, there is no point adding these models back to the original data. Otherwise, otherwise, I, I see a point. Uh, it helps. Uh, let's see. Can you explain in a bit more detail how you decide which models to discard and which to include in the meta model? It, actually, it's not that intuitive. I mean, it's just a simple. Uh, 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 I use standard feature selections technique like the one I just described. So you will be surprised that there are models that, if you use this permutation example I used, like uh, when you, you train a model with, with a feature in, then you randomly shuffle it, you put it back in only at prediction time, and the predictions are better which it doesn't really make sense. I mean, but it happens like so many times. So you have a feature at prediction time which is completely wrong. Like it's, you, you have, it has the same distribution as the one when you train it, but you have completely random, randomly, you have randomly put it in and the predictions are better. So I know this feature is useless. You know, and that's, and that's because, you know, it, 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 was, it was just noise having it in. It actually, this, this really helps to get, you, to get rid of, of, of bad models. You, 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 it's called permutation, feature selection with permutations. It's, it's the one I have found most reliable. But nothing stops you for, for trying other things, like forward selection, for example. Add one prediction at a time, do cross-validation, is it better? Yes, keep it in, or no, remove it, try the next one. 
So I think this is an interesting idea. Are all the models evaluated using the same metric? Uh, can you use different metrics to introduce variety? That's a very good way to use variety. I always, I always do this. So let's say even in a binary problem, I do try to run some models with a root mean square error or, or with a Huber error or, uh, because they tend to generate diversity to focus in different areas. I do this all the time, yes. It's a good way to generate diversity. So I think this should be a pretty straightforward one. Does driverless AI uh, is doing stacking and the new features actually weights for each models? Um, so we, we have just added a, a simple way of stacking with something called the linear blender, which is we try to find the best linear weights to combine models. Um, but this will be a, a expanded, obviously. This is just a first, a first quick version to do this. So the answer is yes, it supports stacking. The, the full answer is it's still, still a bit simple, but it will, it will, it will improve. Um, yeah. When not all errors are equal, more important to predict some values more accurately, uh, does ensembles help you in your experience? Actually, we're out of time. That was my cue. <laughs> all right. Okay. So uh, let's give uh, Marios another hand. <laughs>